Alrighty, y'all. Welcome to a fun semester of 211. Today we're taking a look at the recitation for Friday, January 28th. Uh, my name is Sydney. I am one of the peer coaches, and I teach a couple of the recitations. I help out the TAs, and I'm just going to be uh, working through some of the recitation problems just for as a guide uh, if you want to look back on to review for exams. All right, so for question one, we're looking at two runners, right? So we have Alice. I'm going to use green for Alice, and we'll use purple for Bob, right? We'll make, and that's going to be, obviously, we can abbreviate with A and B, right? They start at opposite ends of a 100-meter long soccer pitch, and then they start running towards each other, right? Alice runs 8 meters per second, starting on the east. Bob runs 6 meters per second, starting on the west. And now we're trying to find out where they meet. All right, so let's start. I'm going to start by drawing a picture of what I'm looking at, right? So we're going to have our soccer pitch. Now, I reffed soccer for a hot minute, so I should know what this looks like, but it's not going to be perfectly accurate. All right, I'm going to say that this is our east side and this is our west side. It doesn't matter if you flip it or not, because, again, we're just setting up our axes. You can set it like this or you can set it either way, all right? And then Alice, which you said was green, starts over here, and Bob starts on the west, right? And we know that Alice is running from the east to the west. Bob is running from the west to the east, right? And Bob was going six meters per second, and Alice is going eight meters per second. Cool, so now we have a start. But what we need to do now is we need to set up a consistent we need to set up a consistent coordinate system, right? So we know that our length of the whole field is 100 meters, right? So I'm going to set, and you can do this either way, but I'm going to set my 0 over here, and I'm going to set 100 over here, right? This is just our position in meters. So when I go over to my graph over here, I'm going to do the same thing. We're going to have our position in meters. And over here, it's going to be our time, I'll put it underneath actually, time in seconds, right? And we're going to say 0 meters is down here, and 100 meters is up here. And I'm just going to break the bottom into intervals of 2 seconds each. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 15, 20. Wonderful, right? So now let's work out our position versus time graph, right? So we know that Alice starts, the way we set it up, Alice starts at 100 meters. That's the position before they start running. So Alice starts up here, right? And she's running to the left, right? Which we're gonna say is our, it was the negative velocity. She's running to the left at eight meters per second, right? So our velocity, to the left is going to be the slope of our position versus time graph, right? So we know our slope is going to be 8, and since we're saying that to the left is negative, we're going to have a slope of negative 8 meters per second, right? So if I roughly estimate that, it means she's going to be, after 10 seconds, she's going to go 80 meters, and now I'm just going to draw a straight line between the two, right? goes just like that, and I'm going to extend it all the way down to the axis. All right, cool. There's Alice. Now let's look at Bob, right? Bob starts at where we said zero was, right? So he starts down here, right? And now we know that they're running at a speed of six meters per second, and since they're going to the right, and we said that the right was positive, which again, you can do it either way. This is just the coordinate system I set up, so I'm gonna stick with this one. As long you can set the coordinate system however you want, as long as you keep it consistent throughout the problem. All right, so we're running at six meters per second, so now we're just gonna set up that slope. So that means after 10 seconds, they're gonna go 60 meters, and that's gonna be our straight line for Bob, going through there. 
All right, there's our position versus time graph for both runners on a single set of axes. All right, and we said that, again, remember we said green was Alice and purple was Bob. Wonderful. Now we have to write our position versus time equations for both runners, all right? So let's start with Bob, all right? This is our equation is that our position is our initial position plus our velocity times time. Again, this is with a constant velocity, all right? So let's start with Bob. So that's gonna be our XB. And I'm just gonna mark this because we said it was purple. So there we go, now it's in purple. But we're gonna say, right? So now we have our, what's our initial position? We go back to our graph, we go back to what we said as our axes. Bob starts at a position of zero, right? So it's gonna be zero. And I just draw my zeros like this. This is, that's just a way that I draw my zeros. Uh, don't worry about that. Uh, plus our velocity, right? And we said that our velocity for Bob, or our slope of our position versus time curve, was six meters per second, and it's a positive because that's the way we set that our set our axes. Ooh, I don't know what happened there. That's gonna be our six, and we can multiply that times time. Right? So simplifying that out, Bob's position is gonna be. 6t. Cool. Now let's take a look at Alice, right? So when we abbreviate with xa, we go through the same thing. We have our x0, our initial position, right? And for Alice, we said that she starts on the far side of the field, and we set that to be our 100 meters, right? So her initial position is 100 plus, and now we add, right? We have our plus, our velocity. And we said that the velocity, again, the slope of this line, is 8 meters per second, but it's a negative slope. So it, and we said that it's a negative velocity because of the way we set the axes. Okay. So it's going to be a negative 8 for our velocity times time. And again, simplifying this, you get that Alex's position, Alice's position, my bad, equals 100 minus 8t. I'll just look a gross looking eight. There we go. So now we uh, approach uh, this entire problem. We try to get it into a sentence that we can then interpret more easily, right? That's involving our algebraic variables, right? So what is the value of blank at the time when blank equals blank, right? So we go back to our original question, right? We're trying to find where they'll meet, right? So where we know their position versus time for each thing. We're trying to find where on the field, across our field, they're going to be at the same place at the same time. So what is the value of either of their positions? So just position, this can be XB or XA because they should be the same, right? And that's the spoiler for over here, at the time when Bob's position is equal to Alice's position, or when Alice's position is equal to Bob's, right? We're trying to find what the position is when the positions are the same, right? And this is like at that time, right? Cool, now we do this algebra, right? So we want to set xa equal to xb, right? xa equals xb. And fortunately, we have our equations that we just uh, got for our xa, Alice's position, and our xb, Bob's position, as a function of time. All right, so we can plug in our equation for xa, which was uh, 100 minus 8t, right? We can set that equal to, and that's just that there, right? We can set that equal to Bob's position, which was 6t, right? And that's what that becomes, right? Now, we have one equation, one unknown. Now we just have to solve for our time, right? Because we're trying to find the value of the position at the time when the two are equal, right? So first we have to find the time, and then we can work backwards and find our position, right? So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna add 8t to both sides, and we're gonna get 100 equals 14t. And this is gonna give us that our time is approximately 
0.286 seconds. Right? You don't have to go to as many decimals as I do. I just like decimals. It's fine. <laughs> and now that we have our time, right, that's not our final answer. Like we solved the equation. Wonderful. Great. We got this intermediate value. Sorry. And that's an, this is an S, not a 5. Right? So seconds. I'm trying to write that. Right? We got this intermediate value time. But we're trying to find the position across our field that we that they meet, right? So now we can plug this time back into one of our equations for one of the positions, right? Because it it's there's the same position is going to be the same. So we whichever one we solve, it's going to give us the same answer. So I'm going to plug back into the equation for Bob's position, right? So we're going to get x b equals 6t, and then we plug in 6 times 7.143, right? And multiplying all that out, we're going to get that xb, which should be the same as xa, is going to be 42.85714 meters, right? And again, units are important, meters. But we also want to make sure that we keep it consistent with our original, how we described it originally. So based on what we just solved for, this 42 meters is going to be 42 meters from our zero, 42 meters from the west side of the field, right? 42 meters from west. Okay, right? wonderful. And obviously it's 100 minus that to find the distance from the east. Now we say that Bob has a two-second head start. What would change in the graphs and what would change in the algebra, right? So if we look at our graphs, right, Bob had a two-second head start. Right, we said purple was Bob. That means that we can approach this one of two ways, right? We can find out, we can have it go the exact same, but slow down Alice by two seconds and have her start so we'll have her initial time start at 2 and continue from here. All right? So we can just have her wait and then have the same slope, and then it, they would meet a little bit later. We could do this because at this point, if we decide that time is the time since Bob has started, if we set t equals 0 for when... Bob starts, then we can say that, and then we get that our equation for Aleph, Bob, stays the same. Bob's position is going to stay the same. It's just going to be 6t, because he's still running the same. But Alice now has to wait those two seconds, so it's going to be 100 minus 8, but instead of just regular time, it's going to be time minus 2, because she's two seconds behind. Right? Or we could say that time is still when Alice starts. Time equals zero, right? Or t equals zero would be when Alice starts, right? And at this point, we know Bob had a two-second head start, right? But our equation for position doesn't account for a two-second head start. It only accounts for a position head start, so what the initial position is. So what we can do is we can figure out, right, in a normal situation, how far does Bob travel in two seconds, right? Xb equals six times, right, after two seconds, how far is Bob going to travel? So we can see that he's going to get a bonus head start of 12 meters, right? So now this, since we're setting t equals zero to when Alice starts, Bob is already at now starting at this position of 12 meters per second, 12 meters per second, 12 meters, an extra position, x naught of 12 meters, right? This becomes x naught for Bob, right? So now if we rewrite the position versus time equation, Alice's equation stays the same because we said that t equals zero when Alice starts, so that hasn't changed from the original problem, but now, Bob, we have to have our x naught 12 plus 6t, right? Because again, our equation for position versus time.
starts with our x naught plus velocity times time. Right? So we can set it up in two different ways, and our equations look different. Both are accurate. Right? It's the same thing as when we set up our axes. We just pick a direction, and as long as we keep it consistent, it'll work. It's the same thing here. We pay, make a decision, pick a way to approach it, and as long as we keep it consistent, the math will work out. Right? So now we look at our kinematics relations. Right? These relations aren't always true, but they are true in a specific case. And the reason they're true is right, we know that... Uh, that our velocity is, if you took calculus, velocity is going to be our derivative of position, right? So we take the derivative of this with respect to time, and it gives us this, right? The only way that this makes sense is if that A becomes, it not becomes, if A is constant over time. So if our acceleration is constant, right, because then this is just a constant coefficient, and it, we don't have to multiply by the derivative of all that mess, right? So the only time when we can use these kinematics relations, these equations, is when it's a constant acceleration, or when we can assume it to be a constant acceleration. And a constant acceleration, that means that the acceleration is equal to any constant number, like if it was gravity, g, or like four, whatever it is, but it also can mean that it's a constant at zero, right? That just means this term disappears and we're left with our thing from before. We just ignore this part for right now, right? Because multiply by zero, that disappears. This gives us what we were looking at before with our constant velocity position equation, right? Because if acceleration is zero, velocity is constant and that makes sense with what we've been talking about. Wonderful. Next, the bouncing basketball. Now, I remember this question from when I took 211, and I remember loving it. It's so much fun, right? So right, we're looking at a bouncing basketball, and we're going to draw position, velocity, and acceleration curves versus time, right? So we're going to set, again, we're going to set our coordinate system, right? I'm going to say that up is a positive position. And I'm going to say that the ground is where our position equals 0. And I'm going to say, and because I'm saying that up is positive, that means a velocity going up is also a positive velocity. And the same thing, velocity pointing down is negative. And since it's the same thing. If acceleration is pointing up, it's going to be positive acceleration. If acceleration is pointing down, it's going to be a negative acceleration. Right? So I'm going to start with just what we know. Right? Let's start with the position graph. I'm going to say, right, we know it starts from rest at the top of the bounce. Right? We know that it's going to start here. Actually, I'm not going to use black to graph this because... It'll blend in with the actual graph stuff, right? We know it starts from the top of the bounce because, right, we know we're holding it and then we let it go and then it falls, right? When it hits the ground, we know it's at the ground, so we can mark that as well. At the top of the bounce, again, we know that it's going to be at a maximum. And when it hits the ground again, we know it's going to be back at the ground. Cool. Now we work on connecting those. And I'll revisit that in a second. Right. So what we're going to do, right, we're going to start, then we're going to take a look at just marking some things on our velocity, right? We know our velocity, it says that it starts from rest in our hand, right? So it's going to start at zero, right? And then it's going to start going down. Right? We know our velocity is going to go down, so we know it's going to be going, it's going to be negative in somewhere negative, right? And then when it hits the ground, we know it's going to start going up again. So we know it's going to be positive for a while. And at the top of the bounce, it, for a split second, since it's going from, it's going to go positive, it's going to be going positive, and then it's going to be going negative for a split second, it has to switch between positive and negative. 
So at the top of the bounce, it's going to be zero for a split second, right? And then when it hits the ground again, it's going to be back toward going towards negative. It's going to be negative again because it's going back towards the ground, right? So what we can do, we can look at our top. We know it starts from rest, so the slope of our position graph is going to be horizontal for just a split second, right? And then we know it starts going down, so the slope has to be getting more and more negative. Right? The slope has to be negative, going down, and it's going to be more and more negative, right? So we can get it increasing, increasing, increasing. Ooh, that's a bad curve, my bad. Right? Because if I draw, if I just pick a point and mark the slope, right, we see up here the slope is kind of gradual negative. But if we go down here, it gets more negative. All the way down here, it's more negative, right? So that is our increasing slope there, which means that when we go back to our velocity curve, it's going to be getting, we knew it was going to be negative, but we know it's getting more and more and more and more negative as we go, right? So we're going to draw it getting more and more and more and more negative until we get to this minimum here, right? I won't draw a point there for right now, okay? And now what happens as we look at this whole bounce here, right? It hits the ground, it goes back up to the top, and then hits the ground again. What it's going to do, right, it's going to bounce, and it's going to be going really fast for a while, and then it's going to gradually slow back down again, right? Our slope is going to get less and less and less positive until it hits what we said, our zero velocity up here, right? Because again, we want this to be tangent there horizontal, right? And then the same thing happens as it did before, right? We see here it got more and more and more negative. Now the same thing's going to happen from the top of the bounce. It's going to get more and more and more negative, right? So you can draw, I'm going to draw that. More and more and more and more negative, right? So there's the general gist of our position versus time curve, right? So now we can look at the same thing over here. We see that the slope of our velocity, uh, slope of our position, sorry, goes from being very negative to very positive very quickly, right? So we know that all of a sudden here, it shoots up. Whoops. Shoot, I can't draw that line for some reason, I'm sorry. It's gonna shoot up real quick, right? Because now we have a very positive slope if I draw that tangent line. It's gonna be very positive right here, but it's gonna be getting less positive as we go, right? So if we start real positive at that point and then get less positive as we're approaching that zero again, that's what we're gonna look like. It's generally supposed to be a straight line. My hand's a little shaky, it's all right, right? And then the same thing happened as before, right? Because we started at zero and then we got more and more and more and more negative, right? So it's the same thing over here. We're gonna hit this zero over here. It's gonna get more and more and more and more negative like that. So here's our velocity versus time. Okay? Now our acceleration is our slope of our velocity. Right? This is a straight line. Our slope's constant until we get to this mess over here. right? So our slope of the line is negative and it's a constant. So what we can do is we can just say right here it's going to be all the way like this. Ooh, crooked line. Kind of like that. right? And here's our zero, right, because we're in the negative down here. That looks like it's sloping downwards. I'm sorry, it's supposed to be a constant. Straight line, horizontal line, right across, right? Then we see here, right, our velocity suddenly changes, right? Our acceleration is our change in velocity over change in time. Our velocity changes from really, really negative to really positive. So that's a sudden positive acceleration. And the slope of this is really, really positive. The slope of that's really positive because it goes up almost instantly, right? So that's where we're going to get this like weird kind of spike. Ooh, that's quite the spike. Kind of spike in our acceleration where all of a sudden it gets super, super positive, right? Because that's our change in velocity and our change in time is really small, right? And then it's this same, this same constant slope all the way across the rest of it, right? So we just have that one spike there. Right, and we keep going. And if we were to keep going right here, 
if the bounce continued, right, it would bounce, this whole cycle would kind of start again, it would hit the ground here and bounce again, right, we would have another place where the velocity changes very quickly. So we'd have this another little like spike of our acceleration, but that's kind of off the graph at this point. So we'll just know that it's there. Right? Cool. Hope that kind of made sense. That one's a little tricky, but as long as you get the gist of uh, how the graphs fit together too and why they look the way that they do, that's pretty good, right? All right, question four, a braking car, right? So we have a car traveling at a certain velocity, applies its brakes, and it slows down to a different velocity, right? The, it decelerates at five meters per second. How far does it travel during the braking period? So decelerate is usually used to mean like slow down, but really what it means is acceleration. It means that there's acceleration that, yeah, it usually means it goes, it slows down, but this can mean going from a really big negative velocity to a smaller negative velocity or a really big positive velocity to a less positive velocity. So this does not mean that it, the acceleration is negative, right? So let's set up our axes first. This does, yeah, this doesn't necessarily mean that our acceleration has to be negative. So I'm going to set up how I'm going to approach the axes, right? I'm going to say the car starts over here and it's moving to the right at 30 meters per second. And then at some later time, right, it's now moving at 10 meters per second, right? So we're trying to find the distance between these two points. And we know that, oh, I'm going to draw these a little bit more to scale, I think, right? Something like that, right? We want this one to be longer than this one. So velocity, but these are our velocity vectors, right? So we're trying to find our delta x for this or our change in position for this, right? And we know that our acceleration is going to be the distance difference between these two vectors, right? In this case, since I'm saying that this is going to be the positive direction and this is the negative direction, right? I'm going to say that the ex because I know that it's traveling to the right and it's being it's slowing down to the right, it's Sorry, the direction of motion is to the right, and the car is slowing down. Therefore, our acceleration vector is some magnitude is going to be our some magnitude, which is given our five meters per second, five meters per second squared to the left, right? So that's going to be that is going to be an end up being a negative acceleration. But if I decided to say visualize this and say that the car starts over here and now it's going 30 meters per second this way, right? And then it's here and it's going 10 meters per second. Really, our, the x that we're looking for is gonna be the same. And I'm gonna still say this is positive, this is negative, right? The x is gonna end up being the same because it's still changing the same amount. It's still changing the velocity in the same way at the same rate but now the acceleration is going to be pointing opposite like that. That's going to be a positive acceleration because it's pointing in this positive direction, right? Same thing would happen if I came over here and just said, I want to make this side positive and this side negative, right? Now this is a positive acceleration. This is a negative velocity getting less negative, right? But just for simplicity's sake, the way I said it first, that's the way I'm going to do it because that's the way my brain worked it out at first, right? So our velocities are both positive, getting less positive, so we're going to have a negative acceleration, right? So now we have to write expressions for the car's position and velocity as a function of time, right? What moment does it make sense to choose for reference as our time equals zero, right? If we look back at our equations from up here, right? I'm going to use, these are our equations for velocity and position as a function of time. We, can we said we can only use these when there's a constant acceleration, right? So while the car is traveling at our constant, before it starts braking, the car is traveling at our 30 meters per second, right? And our velocity isn't changing while it's traveling at just that. So that means during this time, our acceleration equals zero meters per second squared, right? And then after it starts braking as well, right? After it starts braking, we were given that our acceleration and we said it was going to be negative. 
is our negative 5 meters per second squared, right? So since our acceleration changes from here to here, we can't look at the whole, like, we can't just look at it from the beginning somewhere and call that t equals 0. We want to find a, a time with a constant acceleration so that we can apply these equations, right? So I'm going to set t equals 0 to when the car starts braking, right? Right, because at that instant, our acceleration is equal to negative 5 meters per second in our system that we set up. And it doesn't change throughout as we're slow throughout the entire time that we're trying to look at, the time that we're slowing down. Right? Because that also gives us how far it travels during the braking period. Right? If we start our t equals zero when it starts braking, and then we're we find how much time has passed to when it ends braking, right? You can find the time of this. Oh, those are quite the brackets. All right? We find, I set this equal to zero, this equal to whatever time that we're figuring out. You would do a, to find our change in time, it would be the final minus initial. If our initial is just zero, it doesn't matter. Right? If that kind of makes sense. That part was a little, either way. When the car starts braking, it gives us a constant acceleration. And it also uh, allows us to just solve for the time that it gets to where uh, the time that it does that because if our t zero at this point, then that's also going to be our initial position is also going to be zero at that point, right? So now we just get our equations as a function of time, right? Our position as a function of time, we're given that it's the initial position, which we just said was zero, plus our initial velocity, which we said was 30, times t. And again, I said this was a positive 30 just because, because that's the way I set it up. Right? Plus 1 half times our acceleration, which we said was negative 5 meters per second squared, t squared. And again, just as we're going through, I'm going to make sure everything's in consistent units. Right? This is in meters per second. This is meters per second squared. Everything in base units usually gives you a pretty good... Uh, uh, way to work through it because you're not going to have to juggle the units after the fact, right? So I'm just going to simplify this equation, get rid of the zeros. 30t uh, minus 5 over 2t squared. Cool. Now we do the same thing. We get our velocity equation right, as a function of time. And we have our initial velocity, 30, plus acceleration, again, negative 5 meters per second squared times time. And then again, simplified, b of t equals 30 oops, minus 5t. There we go. All right, so now we have our equations for position and velocity as a function of time. Now we're going to approach how to put it into a sentence again. Right? What is the value of blank at the time when blank is equal to blank? Right? So we're trying to find how far it travels. So how far it travels, that's going to give us our, we're trying to find our final position. Right? So that was the value of the position or just x in terms of like uh, the variables we're using in this. What is our position at the time when blank is equal to blank? Right? Because that's, again, that's what the question is asking for how far it travels. Right? And it's asking during the braking period. So the braking period, we set that our zero is when the braking period starts. So we're trying to find the position when the breaking period ends, at the time when the breaking period is end, over. So at the time, we know that the breaking period is over because it's breaking until it slows down to 10 meters per second. So at the time when velocity is equal to 10 meters per second, that's going to be the end of our breaking period. When our velocity gets to 10 meters per second, that's our end. And if we find the position at that end, then that's going to give us our distance traveled during the braking period, right? What intermediate quality must we find before we can do this, right? So, right, we're trying to find when our velocity is equal to 10, right? So if we plug that into here, we're just going to end up solving for our time, right? Because this is our thing, at the time when. So we use our, this final quantity to solve for the time at which this happens, and once we have the time that it happens, 
then we can plug it into our position equation and find the position that it happens, right? So our intermediate value, we're going to find time, right? So if we plug that in, our velocity, and we said the final velocity that we wanted to happen was 10. So we're going to set that equal there, equals our equation, which was 30 minus 5t. Okay. So you solve this real quick. I'm going to uh, bump it to the other side. 20 equals 5t. T equals 4 seconds. Seconds. All right, cool. Now we have how long it takes for the car to slow down that much. Right? And now, how far does car travel during the braking period? Now that we have how long it takes to slow down, we can find out how far it, it goes while it's slowing down. Right? So let's plug this time into our equation for uh, position. Right? We get our x is equal to 30 times t minus 5 over 2 t squared and we're setting and we're trying to find what that's equal to we're not setting it equal to anything this time my bad all right simplifying all this we get x equals uh three times 30 times 4 is 120 all right and then this is gonna be 16 divided by 2 is 8 5 times 8 is 40 so it'd be minus 40 all right and we're gonna get that it's 80 meters all right so we're gonna be by the time we finish braking the car, by the time the car gets to 10 meters per second, we will have traveled 80 meters from that original point. Okay. All right, and that's the end of this first recita uh, this recitation. Uh, let me know if you have any more questions about this or anything else, uh, and I will do my best to try to explain them because I guess Sydney explains stuff.